So this is joint work with uh, Masood Saida Ardekani, who just completed his PhD at the University of Paris and uh, will soon be joining the Purdue University. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, the contributions of Marcos Mahesh and uh, Rama. So let me start with a uh, hypothetical scenario to motivate this work. In this scenario, we have data placed in a data center in California. Um, this data is then replicated to another data center in Europe uh, where it's lazily updated. We have a dedicated group of people in California who access this data and share it with other similar-minded groups in various places across the world. So for instance, we have a group in China, a group in India, a group in England, and a group in the Pacific Northwest, all happily sharing this data until one day, uh, someone decides without any warning whatsoever to, <laughs> you guys are laughing. to get rid of one of these groups. <laughs> okay, and now you may agree that this is horrible. <laughs> because the system is now left in a placement of replicas that's not a good configuration, okay? So, a disclaimer, this is a fictional story, as they say in the movies. Okay, any resemblance to actual labs, living or dead, is purely coincidental. <laughs> but it does illustrate a point, which is that things change. Customers come and go, and cloud storage systems need to adapt. So based on this work, or based on that observation, this work is about a configuration service that we developed that has two main functions. First. If your system is in a configuration that's not optimal, it will try to choose a better configuration for you. It will base that configuration on the needs of all the clients that are currently sharing the data that's being, that's, that's being configured. Certainly, any given configuration is not ideal. It may be better for some clients. It may be worse for other clients. But what this configuration service tries to do is look at the overall set of users and produce a configuration that's beneficial to the group. And the second thing it does is, assuming you're not in the right configuration, it will migrate the system automatically from the current configuration into the new configuration by taking a step sequence of steps. And it does this without quiescing the system or any of its applications. It does that why does this while clients are continuing to issue read and write operations to the system. And that's one of the major challenges that we faced. So what exactly do I mean by a configuration? Our system is built on Pileus. You may remember my talk from last year's SOSP where I talked about Pileus. The, the replication model is that we have a core set of servers that are primary replicas. These replicas are mutually consistent and completely up to date at all times. In addition, we have secondary replicas who are lazily updated from the primary replicas. Writes all go to the primary replica. Reads can be performed either at a secondary replica or at a primary replica. And so a configuration in this case is the set of primary replicas and their locations. By location, I don't mean what particular rack are they located in or running in or what server, because the clients don't care about that. What I mean is what data centers are they running in? The second part of the configuration is where are they, all the secondary replicas located and what data centers are they located? There may be no secondary replicas. Typically, we do have configurations that do have secondary replicas, however. Um, and then the third part of the configuration is how frequently do these secondary replicas synchronize with the primary replicas to get their data, meaning which indirectly says how stale can they become. The other aspect of Pileus that we exploit that you may remember is that Pileus uses consistency-based service level agreements. Applications can specify declaratively what consistency they're willing to tolerate and what round trip times they're willing to accept for their read operations. These consistency-based LSA is a sequence of consistency latency pairs associated with each pair, which are rank ordered, is a utility that specifies the relative importance of that pair to the application. In Pileus, each client who was executing read operations given one of these consistency-based SLAs 
would try to maximize the utility for each individual read operation given the current configuration of the system. In this work, our configuration service takes a more global approach by trying to figure out how we can maximize the utility, not for the individual client, but for all of the clients in unison, and it can do that by changing the configuration rather than treating it as a fixed entity. And this utility that's embedded in the SLAs provides a nice metric for deciding whether one configuration is better than another configuration. So if you look at our configuration service, it takes a number of inputs. Um, one of the key inputs is data about who are the customers, who are the clients that are sharing this data, and what are they doing. So in particular, for each client, it wants to know what are the SLAs that that client is using, what are the reads and writes that that client is performing, by reads and writes, I don't mean details about which particular blobs are being read and written, but I mean aggregate information about the number of reads and writes that it's performed recently. Um, and also, the configuration service wants to know what's the latency, what's the round trip time between this client and all of the data centers, the data centers where the data is replicated and the data centers where the data could potentially be replicated if it's not currently being replicated there. For given this information about a particular client, and given a proposed configuration, the configuration service can then produce an estimate of the utility delivered by that configuration to that particular client. If it does this across all of the clients, and it, it then computes an a, um, average overall utility across all of the clients that have reported this information to it, and it weights that average according to how many read operations that clients are performing, and it uses that now as the metric that it tries to optimize in selecting a configuration. So the other input to it is what types of configurations should it consider? We have a configuration generator that in our current implementation generates a complete list of all possible configurations and submits that to the configuration service for consideration. In our particular case, the number of data centers is really small, or is, you know, order less than 10, and so generating an exhaustive list of the possible configurations is not unreasonable, and that is, in fact, what we do. Um, however, I should point out that even though there's potentially a large number of configurations it would consider, it's almost certainly, without any other constraints, going to pick one particular configuration. Specifically, it's going to pick the configuration where it decides to put a replica in every single data center and make all of those replicas primary replicas because that would be the configuration that maximizes consistency and maximizes performance for reads across all of the clients that are located across the world. However, if you came to a user or an application developer and said, pick a, a configuration, that's probably not the configuration they would pick because they have other constraints in mind. And so another input to our configuration service is a set of constraints that limits the types of configurations that can be chosen out of this list of possible configurations. Um, so these constraints are things like, how many replicas do you want? You can say, I want at least two replicas, but I want at most five replicas of this data. Um, you can put constraints on where the data is located. You can say things like, I want this data to only reside in Europe. Don't give it to the US. Um, and you can, um, and cost is also an important constraint. So another input that we have to our configuration service is a cost model. This cost model is based on the pricing that Azure charges because our system is built on Azure. Um, so it knows in particular how much it costs to store data, it knows how much it costs to communicate data across data centers and within data centers. Um, and our configuration service takes this cost model and uses it to compute two costs for two types of costs for each potential configuration that it's considering. One is the ongoing cost of running in that configuration. How much does it cost to store the data? How much does it cost to synchronize all of the replicas that you have? The second cost it computes is the one-time cost of moving from the current configuration into the configuration that's possibly considering as the new configuration. Given these two costs, now we have enough information, given this cost model, all the information inputs from the cl clients, we have enough information now to compute a configuration. And what we do is we compute the configuration that maximizes the overall expected utility per dollar. Now, assuming that this configuration is not the current configuration, the next thing the configuration service does is it figures out how to migrate 
incrementally from the current configuration into the new desired configuration. It produces a list of actions for, um, for making this transition. These actions are what you would expect, things like moving the primary, adding new primaries, adding new secondaries, adjusting the uh, frequency with which secondaries receive updates from the primary, and so on. For many of these operations, they're fairly harmless. You can do them while the system is running, no problem whatsoever. For instance, consider adding a secondary replica. If you want to put a new secondary replica into service, the configuration service just does it. It doesn't require any coordination at all with any of the clients. The clients will eventually learn that there's a new replica and start using it, no problem. Other types of reconfiguration, like changing the set of primary replicas, it's a little more delicate because clients actually need to know what the current set of primary replicas is when they do write operations, and they need to know the current set of primary replicas when they do strongly consistent read operations. Okay, so let me give you one example. Oh. So let me give you one example of what our most complex uh, reconfiguration action, which is moving the primary. Okay, so in this example, we want to, we have an existing primary, and we want to move it into a new data center and, and get rid of the old primary or downgrade the old primary. Okay, so, so this involves a coordination between the current primary, which I'll call the old primary, and the new primary. It happens in two phases. Each phase involves a reconfiguration, so there's two different reconfigurations that's going to go on here. In the first phase, the reconfiguration service does the following. It makes a note that there's a reconfiguration in progress by setting a special flag on the configuration that says there's a reconfiguration in progress. We call this the RIP flag. The configuration service then waits delta seconds for all the clients to realize that the reconfiguration is in progress. I'll explain later a little bit more about where this delta seconds come from and what it means. Um, after waiting for delta seconds, it then adds the new primary replica to the list of write-only replicas. If there is no replica in the, in the data center where it's trying to place the new primary, it will create the replica. If there's already a secondary replica there, it simply takes that existing secondary replica, adds it to this list of write-only primaries. What that means is that this replica will now start receiving updates from clients. Okay, so it clears the RIP flag to let the clients know that this reconfiguration is done. The clients will now start operating in the new configuration, which means that any write operation will go to both the old primary and to the new primary. Pybase is already set up to use uh, multi-master replication if you want it, or multi-primary replication, and so we simply take advantage of that feature of, of Pyvius, and we now have multiple masters or possibly we already had multiple masters and we now have one additional master replica. Okay, so this allows the new primary to get all of the new updates that are happening in the system, but we still can't put it into service because it may be missing old updates. You know, data that's not being actively updated, the, the uh, new primary may not have the latest versions for all of that data, so it needs to get them somehow. So the next step, next step is that we initiate synchronization between the old primary and the new primary. We know that this synchronization will eventually complete because there's a bounded number of objects that need to be retrieved. Because we're not worrying about ongoing updates, we're only worried about the versions that aren't changing, the stable versions in the system. So the synchronization may take a while to happen, but we don't care because none of the clients are blocked, it's happening in the background, it will eventually finish. If we just relied on synchronization to bring the new primary up to date, it might never catch up because writes are continuing to happen. So having this dual form, this dual process where writes go from directly from the client to the new primary and the old versions go from the old primary to the new primary, we're guaranteed that we'll eventually get to a point when the synchronization ends where the new primary is completely up to date, independent of what writes have been going on in the process. And so at this point, we can now make it a full-fledged primary. So we do another reconfiguration, we go the same we do the same dance, we set the RIP flag, we wait delta seconds. After delta seconds, we take the new primary, we add it to the list of full featured primaries, we take the old primary, we downgrade it to a secondary replica. We could take the old primary and completely take it out of service, but there's no reason not to make it a secondary replica. It already holds the data, so why not just let keep it around as a replica unless we really do want to get rid of the number of replicas. So as long as it meets our constraints, we currently just leave it around. 
Okay, so that's an example of the actions that are taken by the configuration service. And now what I want to do is switch gears and, and show you what happens on the client side. So each client in our system is in one of two modes. It's in either slow mode or fast mode. Each client caches information about the current configuration of the system, and it uses that cached configuration locally to perform its read and write operations. A client is in slow mode if its cache of the configuration may be out of date. It's not sure whether it's completely accurate. A client is in fast mode if it knows that its cached configuration is accurate and will remain accurate for some period of time. Initially, when a client starts up, it's in slow mode because it may start up with out-of-date information or no information at all. The client then periodically freshes, uh, fetches the configuration from the configuration service, at least conceptually from the configuration service. You'll see in a minute that we don't actually implement it that way, but for the point of view right now, assume that the client is talking directly to the configuration service. It will send it a GET request. The configuration service responds with the current configuration. At this point, the client enters fast mode, and the client implicitly has obtained a lease on that configuration because the configuration service, when it responds, promises not to change the configuration for delta seconds. So the client knows that he can use that configuration without it changing out from under him. This is a fairly standard leasing technique, nothing new here. Um, the client starts his lease at the point that he uh, requested the configuration because he doesn't know exactly at what point in time the uh, configuration service responded, but that's a, a fairly conventional technique. As long as the client continues to renew his configuration uh, frequently enough, the client will continue to remain in fast mode and everything was fine. Um, if the configuration service decides that it wants to do a reconfiguration, then instead of responding with the current configuration to a client that requests it, it will instead respond with the RIP flag set, saying that there's a reconfiguration in progress. This is a sign to the client that his lease was not renewed and that there's a reconfiguration about to happen. At this point, the client enters Oops, what did he do? I just turned it off. Sorry. Uh, at this point, the client enters slow mode uh, for the duration of the configuration, uh, event for the duration of the reconfiguration. Um, eventually, the client, the client remains in slow mode until eventually he sends another request for a configuration and he gets back a configuration that doesn't have the RIP flag set. At that point, he re-enters fast mode and everything's fine. So what does it mean for the client to be in slow or fast mode? How the client performs read and, operation, read and write operations is dependent on what mode he's in. If the client is in fast mode, remember he knows that there's no reconfiguration in progress, he knows that he has the current configuration information, he does read operations exactly as you would do in the standard Pylea system, he uses the SLA to determine where to route the read operation, he sends it to a particular replica, that replica responds and he's done. Same thing with the client in trying to write in fast mode. If he's trying to write in fast mode and there's a single primary, he just does the write to the primary. It's a one-shot operation, request response, he's done. If, the, uh, if there are multiple primaries, then the client has to run a multi-phase protocol to make sure that all the primaries get updated atomically. Uh, that protocol is described in our paper. Um, you can go read it. I'm not going to talk about it now. The key part now is what happens to the client when he's in slow mode. When he's in slow mode, he has to do additional steps in many cases, uh, which is why it's called slow mode. Um, so in particular, if he's doing a read operation in slow mode, he does the read operation exactly as if, as if he were in fast mode, but he has to be aware that he may have read from a, a replica that's no longer a primary because there's a reconfiguration in progress that he doesn't know whether that reconfiguration has actually happened yet or not. Um, if the client doesn't care about strong consistency, no big deal. He'll take the data that he read, returns it to the application, he's done with it. But if the application wanted strong consistency, then the client has to do an additional check to make sure that the, prior, the replica he read from is still a primary. He thought it was a primary at the time he issued the read. Yep, he needs to check that it's still a primary and go on. Um, if the uh, client is in, uh, doing a write in slow mode, uh, then things are a little more complicated. Um, 
In particular, we considered a couple of different approaches, one of which is just to wait until the reconfiguration has happened. He doesn't, in fact, do that um, because we recall in that uh, moving primary protocol I talked about before, the, uh, there's, a, there's a point where the configuration service sets the RIP flag and then waits delta seconds for the uh, information to propagate to all the clients, for all the clients to enter slow mode. During that waiting time, a client can get in, do a write, and get out without the reconfiguration service actually noticing. So in fact, the, um, what we do as our write protocol is we lock the configuration, we do the write, and then we unlock the configuration. The reconfiguration service, when it's doing a reconfiguration, also performs that same locking protocol. And so it's possible for a client to get in, even though there's a reconfiguration in progress, do the write, get out. If the reconfiguration has actually started happening, then the lock request will fail and the client will then wait. Okay, uh, quick implementation notes. We do this all on top of Azure Blob Store. Um, there is no direct communication between the client and the configuration service. Um, all of the communication is done by reading and writing shared blobs. So in particular, the configuration service writes blobs to Azure. The clients all read those blobs. The RIP flag is simply a metadata on top of the special configuration blob, which is stored in a special container, which is stored in a special Azure account. Um, clients upload all of their information as input to the configuration service by also writing blobs. So each client writes a special blob. The configuration service reads those blobs. That includes the client's SLAs and latencies and all of that, and then um, performs any reconfigurations that it wants to do. One nice thing about this arrangement is that we don't actually have to have the configuration service running continuously. The configuration service can go to sleep, wake up periodically, check whether there's a configuration that needs to happen, and then go back to sleep. As long as the clients can read the configuration blob from Azure, which they should be able to do because Azure provides high availability, then they can continue operating in fast mode. Okay, I'm told I have no time for my evaluation. One, okay. Uh, let me give you a quick evaluation uh, setup here. Um, we evaluate this by uh, running clients in different data centers. We have three data centers, one in Asia, one in Europe, one in the US. We have a primary in Asia, we have a secondary in uh, Europe, and currently the US data center is not used as a replica. Uh, we have a number of clients in each of these data centers. The number varies from one to 150 based on the time of day. Um, each of those clients is running the YCSB benchmark. Um, they're using a consistency-based SLA that allows for three types of consistency. They prefer strong consistency, but they tolerate read my rights guarantees, and they will accept eventual consistency. And we have a constraint that there's exactly uh, at most two replicas, one of which has to be a primary. Okay, so if you look at the system without any reconfiguration at all, um, and what we're doing here on the y-axis is measuring the system for a 24-hour period, and we're measuring the average utility delivered to all of these clients over an hour-long period. That's what we're measuring on the y-axis. The x-axis is the 24-hour, and the y-axis is the utility. You'll see that it varies up and down um, based if you have no configuration, because you get higher utility when most of the reads come from Asia, where the primary server is, and you get lower utility when most of the reads come from the U.S., which is where there's no replica currently. Um, if we reconfigure as infrequently as every four hours, you'll see that we get much less variation in the measured utility. Um, and I will, and it actually get, achieves this by moving the primaries around and moving the secondaries around. And I will move on. Um, I know that utility is probably not the most semantically meaningful metric to many of you. And so let me show you one slide that talks about the consistency. Without reconfiguration, we call it that our SLA allows three types of consistency. We get deliver about a third of each of the types of, sorry, uh, each of the types of consistency without the reconfiguration. With reconfiguration, the uh, number of reads that return strongly consistent data goes from 33% to 49%. Okay, I just did it again. Okay, so I'm done here. Um, takeaway point. Storage systems need to adapt. Utility provides a nice metric for evaluating configurations. We've shown that um, you can do automatic reconfiguration without stopping the clients, allowing the clients to continue to do read and write operations. And we showed that by doing so, you can get substantial gains in consistency. Thank you. Single question, very fast question. 
Sorry. So this reminds me of refinancing my mortgage loan. It usually comes down to, well, if I have the house at least three years, it's worth it, but maybe the rates will drop. How do you take into account future changes in your cost models? Uh, future changes in client workloads or? So, so I mean, so first we, amort so as I said, there are two costs, right? There's the ongoing cost and the one-time cost. So first you have to de decide for that one-time cost, how often am I going to reconfigure? Okay, so you can compute that and you can then amortize the cost over a certain 24-hour period or whatever you're, 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 you can compute the cost per day, right? Um, the problem we had, if you looked at the graph I had, there was one point where the reconfiguration service with reconfiguration, we were worse than the non-reconfiguration, and that's because we weren't very good at predicting future performance from past behavior. The client behavior was changing, and in fact, our reconfiguration service ended up in a configuration that was less than ideal because the standard static configuration was actually the ideal configuration at that point in time, and our reconfiguration service kept the primary in the U.S. when it should have migrated it to Asia because it thought that the traffic would continue to come from the U.S. even though it was changing.